In the world of action games, there are many early pioneers, but none are as well-crafted, replayable, or stylish as Devil May Cry. This early progenitor of the character action genre set the standard for what an action game in 3D could really be. That is, until it was overthrown by its own prequel, Not only would DMC3 set the new standard for what 3D action games would be, it would entirely craft a new genre that to this day is only rivaled by later games in its own series. In many ways, 2005 was an important year for the world. Hurricane Katrina, the second term of George W. Bush, and the founding of a little website you may know called YouTube. The soon-to-be media giant just so happened to launch the same year and month as the aforementioned DMC3. This would turn out to be hugely impactful in the way the world played games, and how DMC3 would be perceived. The trailers for the game were circulated around gaming message boards, and there was something really special about it. This game was different. It was edgy and cool, and looked like so much fun. Hell, the trailers themselves even looked like fan-made anime music videos, featuring the game characters themselves. When people finally got their hands on the game, it captivated them. It certainly wasn't for everybody, but for those who it did grab, it would hold on to forever. The game focused on a young, half-demon, half-human known as Dante, and followed him on his quest to stop his brother from summoning all of hell, eat some pizza, and learn the true meaning of family. Its fast-paced action with a strong focus on gameplay complexity and player expression built a sort of mechanical sandbox for the player to explore. To top it all off, it has a slightly melodramatic but ultimately self-aware story with lovable characters. This made it an instant classic, and fans would be playing it for years to come. However, the facilitation of shareable video content from person to person revolutionized how people communicated their passion for video games. Sharing high scores, cool sequences, and even strategies for beating games quickly took center stage. And now, with the ability to share video evidence, communities formed around such activities and have only ever grown since then. Today, speedrunning is one of the largest video game hobbies out there, and for me, DMC3 is a huge part of that. While it may not be the most popular game to speedrun, the tale of how the world record got from where it was back in 2005 to where it is today is a perfect microcosm for speedrunning as a whole, and has some amazing stories attached to it. So sit back, relax, and grab some pizza as I take you through the tears, beers, and cheers of how our little internet forum group of yesteryear became the large, progress-driven community that we are today. This is the speedrun world record progression of Devil May Cry 3. In 2005, speedrunning was a small and underdeveloped hobby, mostly peripherated by internet forum groups centered around Nintendo and other retro games. At the time, there was only really one website that was dedicated solely to storing high-level speed play for games other than Mario and Quake. Enter Speed Demos Archive, or SDA for short. SDA required video evidence for any and all runs, and it only stored the best runs for each respective category. But just being the fastest and having video evidence was not enough for SDA. The site required that the run also be good. Contrary to what you might think, a speedrun can be the fastest ever completed and at the same time, not very good. This is most likely why you see many speedrunners performing something that is really impressive, then immediately dismiss it as bad. The reason for this is, in speedrunning, the amount of competition is pretty low, so being one of the first to complete a run is not enough effort for it to be listed on a site like SDA. SDA wants a clean run. Not perfect, but with minimal mistakes. No game overs, no major time losses, and stuff like that. This is not something that they would have to worry about in the case of DMC3. The earliest recorded speedrun of DMC3, New Game Normal, is still to this day archived on SDA. It's a 2 hours, 14 minutes, and 34 second run by Psycho Child. And let me say, for the time, this run is super impressive. So impressive, in fact, that it would end up standing as the world record from 2005 all the way to 2014. The basic rundown of the category is as follows. The player must start on a new save file, play on the normal difficulty, and complete all 20 missions. Normal is the only difficulty available when starting a new game. 
To unlock easy, the player must die at least three times, then go back and select it. This was deemed to be unfun and not as skillful, so players decided to run on normal instead. One of the things that makes Psycho Child's run so impressive, however, is that he didn't actually play on normal. See, Psycho Child was playing on the original 2005 American release of DMC3, which is notoriously difficult due to the non-Japanese version of the game's normal being the hard difficulty in the JP version. This made him take more damage, deal less damage, and for some rooms have harder enemies appear earlier, as well as bosses just being much more difficult in general. This change would be reversed in 2006 with the release of the special edition of the game, universalizing the difficulty across all regions and adding in the gold orb mode. This mode allows players to restart from a checkpoint on death instead of having to redo the whole mission. This new version also added in turbo mode, speeding up the game an additional 20% and added Dante's brother Virgil as a playable character. So Psycho Child's run was on a harder difficulty than intended, where if he died he had to restart the entire mission and with a 20% speed handicap. If you take away these handicaps and compare his time to current day standards, it's really not that far off. He starts his game in the Trickster style, one of the six fighting styles that Dante can use throughout the playthrough of the game. Trickster allows the circle button to do varying dodging maneuvers that make the player invincible for a short time. He used this primarily to help him survive the bosses and also to make his movement quicker throughout the game. He would stick with this style for the entire run, opting for consistency over speed. The basic rundown for the missions in DMC3 is as follows. Kill demons, go to a new area, kill more demons, sometimes you end up killing a boss, and then you get a rank at the end of the mission. You're given the rank based on the scores of multiple factors that add up to a total score. This total score affects how many bonus orbs, or currency, you will get. This currency is then used to buy items and moves from the shop between or during missions. The faster, more efficient, and ultimately more stylishly you play through a mission will in the long term greatly affect how much buying power you have. And this buying power really comes in handy. Psycho Child makes his way through mission 1 slaying demons in an efficient and stylish manner, getting him an S rank, the best rank possible on the first of 20 missions. This nets him enough money to buy the single most important move in the game, Stinger. While they can only afford level 1 for now, Stinger is beyond useful in the run for closing distances quickly and also crowd control. He then makes his way into mission 2 and does the same strategies as mission 1, but this time it only nets him an A rank. Presumably, if he had gotten the S rank on mission 2, he would have bought Stinger 2 at the start of mission 3. This is still the strategy that is used to this day in speedruns. While missions 1 and 2 are fairly straightforward, Mission 3 gives us a new weapon in the first real boss fight. The Coyote being a shotgun that is very useful to stun groups of enemies, and Cerberus, the great gatekeeper of DMC3. Psycho Child's use of the shotgun in this run is minimal, but Cerberus' impact cannot be understated. After clearing up the strip club of enemies, Psycho Child starts collecting money from an orb or. These ores give the player more money the more they are damaged, and there are several spread out across the game. He also collects the free blue orb fragments to get some progress towards raising his maximum HP. One on the right, and the other one inside a combat adjudicator on the left. Now for the uninitiated, DMC3 is a notoriously hard game. It's not like Ninja Gaiden bullshit levels of hard, but it can be extremely punishing. And a lot of the reason for this notoriety is this boss. Cerberus. Firstly, he's covered in ice that needs to be shot off before you can take any damage and he's really, really aggressive. His attacks come out fast and he can be pretty tanky, not to mention he does a ton of damage if he hits you. The name of the game here is Patience and Consistency. That's what Psycho Child's run was all about, and he demonstrates it perfectly with a great strategy he uses against Cerberus here. By shooting off all the ice and standing at a certain spot, he's able to abuse the boss's AI to get him stuck, then stunned right after, allowing him to wail on the boss, almost killing it. He learned this strategy from someone in the style play community, and that's a relationship that will come up again in the future. Clutching at an S rank, he ranks in his money and buys a few Norse skills on mission 4, namely Air Hike, the double jump, Stinger 2, and Revolver 2 for Cerberus. Then he makes his way across the mission. He takes a pit stop at another Orbor, 
guaranteeing him the S rank on the mission and gets a slightly suboptimal pattern on the Gigapete boss fight. In mission 5, he just heads straight to the boss, grabbing the key item he needs, trickster dashing after stinging ring for extra speed, and he grabs one more blue orb fragment from here. He then arrives at a fan favorite boss, Agni and Rudra. The key here is that their attacks can be knocked back. Doing so two times in a row will leave them open for attack for an extended period of time. This is what he buys Revolver for. However, because of this version he's playing on, it takes three parries instead of two, making the fight much harder. Psycho Child barely makes it out alive. His Trickster leveling up to style level 2 allows for air dodges now. He then equips Agni and Rudra instead of Cerberus and makes his way through mission 6 pretty much as intended. The only mission with absolutely zero combat. He does, however, grab his last needed blue orb fragment to get his first health upgrade. Holy Waters are one of, if not the most important items in the game. They're consumables that will deal tons of damage to anything in the room that they're used in. They'll kill almost any enemy instantly and do a bunch of damage to bosses as well. There are four of them strewn across the map and they can be picked up for minimal time loss. The first free one is here on Mission 7. In Mission 7, there are some of the hardest combat rooms in the game. This enemy, the Greed, will consistently spawn more enemies until he's killed. Killing these Greeds before they can spawn additional enemies is key to ending the encounter fast. In order to do this, Psycho Child uses a technique called Switch Cancelling. This is basically where he cancels the recovery animation of one attack by switching weapons and attacking with the other. This allows for increased DPS. There are three rooms with Greeds on Mission 7 and he doesn't do a very good job of killing them before they spawn in extras, but it's not particularly slow either. Finally, having ascended the entire tower, Psycho Child arrives at the first Virgil fight, collecting one more Orbor along the way. This fight can be very difficult, but he manages to Rebellion spam Virgil to death relatively quickly. Now that Psycho Child reaches Mission 8, a whole new level of complexity has been added onto the run as he's unlocked Dante's Devil Trigger. Devil Trigger, or DT for short, is extremely useful in increasing damage output as well as movement speed. Knowing this, his first instinct is to collect as much money as possible and use it to buy expansions to his maximum capacity for Devil Trigger before the boss fight on Mission 8. Psycho Child ends up buying 4 purple orbs and then beats the boss in 4 cycles. While he makes his way through the next few levels, Psycho Child uses a mechanic called DTE to clear enemy waves efficiently. DTE, or Devil Trigger Explosions, are where you hold down the Activate DT button so that it charges up and releases it all at once for massive damage. This is instrumental in fast room clears. Before the boss on Mission 9, Nevan, he goes out of his way to grab a new gun called Spiral and upgrades it to level 3. He then re-equips Zebris and buys his fifth purple orb before entering the boss room. In the boss, he uses Revolver to break her shield and results in a 6 cycle fight. The next two missions he equips Agni and Rudra again for the spiders and uses a spiral to clear out these soul eaters and do some crowd control. Before the Beowulf boss fight, he realizes a good strategy. The boss has a weak point on its left eye, and if it's hit, it takes massive damage. Aerial Cross, the attack where Dante crosses Agni and Rudra, is perfect since it comes out fast and already does a lot of damage. Psycho Child spams this attack on the eye and gets a really, really fast fight. In Mission 12, he re-equips Cerberus and then runs all the way back to the horse fight. This horse is notorious for being a pain to fight. He runs around in circles in the second phase, not allowing you to hit him. However, Psycho Child deals with him handily in the first phase with a holy water, and in the second phase jumps on top of the carriage to enjoy the ride. After this, he clears out some chess pieces with DTE and heads into Virgil 2, another notoriously difficult boss. Now that Dante's awakened his Devil Trigger, so has Virgil, and that means that there are multiple phases to this boss fight. Virgil starts out with Beowulf and has two main combos. Virgil, the mix-up god, doesn't have a super obvious tell for which combo it is, so Psycho Child stays far away with Trickster. But once he falls under 70% of maximum HP, Virgil's DT will come out to play. This causes him to slowly regenerate health and do more damage, all while being even more aggressive. At about 40% of his health, he'll switch weapons to Yamato. You can use a varying amount of the two weapons to end the fight. 
The longer he is alive, the more times he'll activate Devil Trigger, and in this fight, he activates it three times. So far, the game's been slowly ramping up in difficulty, culminating in the second climax of the game with Virgil 2. But now it kind of chills out from missions 14 to 17, and not much of the dangerous parts of the run are left. During this time, Psycho Child buys three Holy Waters and a Gold Orb. In a room that would normally have Dula Hands on normal, he uses the Holy Water to kill the Blood Goyles, since they're hard to track down and could potentially lose a lot of time if they keep splitting. He also displays a great knowledge about how the DT system works. Taunting, like this, if close enough to enemies, grants the player additional style points and additional Devil Trigger, greatly increasing the damage output of a room if done at the right times. Now that he has Beowulf, this is the main weapon he's going to be using to kill the fodder enemies as it has the highest DPS in the game. He also totally misses the fourth Holy Water at the end of Mission 14. At the start of Mission 15, he uses the Holy Water on these enemies since they can fly through walls, but also since he's on hard mode, they don't die instantly. This means he has to rough them up a bit first. There's also a mandatory fight that can be skipped entirely if you use the dials in the right order. The code is 2122. In this run, Psycho Child uses the code 2422, which while achieving the same thing, is comically slow. On 16, another set of Fallen or Holy Watered. The boss on 16 is Lady, a human girl who helps Dante see the importance of family. She gets promptly punched in the face, using Beowulf, as she runs away in terror. On mission 17, Psycho Child uses Trickster to get the fastest possible cycle up this platforming section that then kills some spiders that would normally be Dula Hands in this room. After that, he fights a new enemy, Abyss, and uses DTE to knock them around. Then he grabs his last Orbor and fights Doppelganger, killing him in about two room cycles with a rather sloppy fight. Mission 18 is the penultimate boss rush in the game. It takes you through the two main rooms that have very hard fights. The first is a chessboard that has a whole chess set made of various enemy types from the game. But to win, you only have to kill the king. And the second room, full of doors, with a challenge board on the wall. Each room conquered fills up a light, and completing a circle on the board allows you to progress onto Mission 19. You can create any circle you want, but each room equates to a boss. The fastest way to go through the rooms is by fighting through Cerberus, Agni Rudra, and Beowulf, since this creates a circle with three points, the second closest being four. When fighting the chessboard, you have to wait for the king to become vulnerable to kill him, and even then, he'll swap himself out with rooks to negate damage. When Psycho Child finally makes it out of the chess room, he buys two holy waters and a couple of healing items, while switching his load up to Agni Rudra with Cerberus. On the refights with these bosses, you can equip whatever you want. Since you don't unlock any more abilities or weapons after this point in the game, you can fully expose their weaknesses. Cerberus has a hard time since he's super weak to Agni Rudra, and the other two bosses play out basically the same as before. Finally, on mission 19, Psycho Child unlocks level 3 Trickster, which just adds an extra teleport move and an additional ground dash. He then switch cancels the hell out of these abyss and heads into the gimmick room with the mirrors. He breaks the mirrors quickly with Devil Trigger and saves some DT for the boss fight, Arkham. Buying a few Devil Stars and even more healing, Psycho Child heads into Arkham. This boss is notorious as it's the only bad boss in the whole game. Well, maybe except for Gigapede. But technically it boils down into two phases. In the first phase, you fight him normally, dealing damage till he wreaks a percent amount of HP, and then he hides underground. Then, these dolphins come out of nowhere and start attacking you, and the boss remains hidden until you defeat them all. Rinse and repeat until he gets to about half HP. At that point, Virgil comes out to help you and you two fight together. However, this removes the player's ability to use Devil Trigger or their style, which ironically removes all of your main damage per second strategies. In the first phase, Psycho Child lets Arkham dive four times. This is incredibly slow, losing upwards of 40 seconds every time he dives. In the second one, he uses three holy waters to chip away at the boss's health, but he still gets one dive in before he's defeated. Now, for the final fight, Psycho Child takes an all-out approach and just wails on Virgil 3. But similar to Virgil 2, the boss can devil trigger and has several phases. At below 40% HP, he will DT every time and become completely invincible for about 6 to 10 seconds. Then he goes batshit crazy and doesn't let you play the game. 
The longer he's alive, the more he can DT, and Psycho Child lets him DT four times. He also almost dies multiple times and has to heal. In the end, he finishes the run with several items still left in his inventory, but a legendary run on the board. As much as I poked holes in this run, it's from 2005, and honestly, it's just astonishing. For the time, it showed a great amount of skill and knowledge of the game's mechanics, and is surprisingly very similar to how we run the game today. If you take out all the load screens and add in turbo mode, it would have been the equivalent of a 140, which today isn't even last place. That's 25th place, and it's not even on the same difficulty as the other runs. Not to mention, it predates anything on the leaderboard by about 10 years. How could that be possible, though? With such a highly beloved game, one known for having lots of high-level players at that, how could no one beat this time, even after the release of Special Edition? Well, the main reason is the activity of the style play community. The most important thing to note when talking about how people get better at a skill is who else is good at that skill. Nothing drives progress like camaraderie and competition. It's very hard for someone to really push a skill to its peak without people around them to push them even further beyond. How are you going to know what is possible if you don't see someone else do it before? How do you know how to gauge how good you are at something if you're the only one to ever do it? When people decide that they want to get good at something, it's usually because it's something that they enjoy doing, and they find a community of like-minded people who do it. What gets people dedicated is other people, and in the case of DMC3, what other people were doing was style play. Like I said before, and I'll say it again, DMC is a series about style, not efficiency. The game has several mechanics incentivizing and sometimes even requiring stylish play, variation in attacks and strategies, creative freedom, and overall, looking fucking cool. That, along with the over-the-top cutscenes and the way the game is marketed, it only makes sense that the initial high-level players for the game would be intrinsically attracted to forming cool combos and seeing how creative they can get. This petri dish of rad shit led to the style play community. Talking back and forth on message boards about strategy and sharing videos of well-crafted combos, this group of stylish individuals pushed the game to its absolute limits. If someone was really loving DMC3 and was looking for an outlet to express their control over the game's mechanics, they would be more inclined to go where the people are. And the people were playing stylishly.
Machine Girl. One thing that was really close to speedrunning that was really popular was getting SS ranks on individual missions on Dante Must Die difficulty. One of the requirements was time, so players had to factor in efficient strategies for building style while doing the most damage possible. Playing this way was especially popular amongst the Eastern players of the time. This is where a lot of the strategies for some of the bosses came from. This, combined with the zeitgeist of speedruns being mostly done in platformers and of Nintendo games, shackled the speedrunning scene from much growth for a long time. Thankfully, there was one globally renowned event that was looking to buck this trend. Games Done Quick had its first event in 2010, having a bunch of speedrunners from around the US showcase their respective speedruns. It was a small event, held in Mikey Yama's mom's basement, but it was streamed live and it showcased many games. Over time, this event would become the absolute center of speedrunning culture, and it sought out to do good for the world and the greater community, raising millions of dollars for charity and giving exposure to smaller communities. Even in the early days, they had runs out there for games that you wouldn't have expected. The first marathon run of a Devil May Cry game was DMC1 New Game Plus Dante Must Die by Breakdown in 2011. He also ran the same category once again in 2012. In 2013, the first run of DMC3 was showcased by Flicky. This was... not what you would hope for from your first showcase of a game at an event like this, but it worked in its own weird ways. It was a new game plus run without using items, played on the very hard difficulty, and was only approximately 4 minutes faster than Psycho Child's run, even though it was ran on the PS3, with infinitely faster loading times, and with turbo. Let's just say it was really bad. So bad in fact that it inspired many players like Private Cinnamon Bun to learn the run out of pure curiosity for what the run would actually look like if done correctly. A lot of early non-Nintendo games at GDQ events were like this, and while it's not ideal, it's what we had. And like I said, it did work in its own backhanded kind of way. This type of run being showcased at an event let the world know that you too can speedrun. You don't have to be a god gamer, and it doesn't even have to be Mario. Just have fun and try your best to go fast. This is where Private Cinnamon Bun would come in and change the fate of Devil May Cry speedrunning. Having hung around the style play community, they decided they wanted to take a crack at improving the run that Flicky did at GDQ. He knew he could do better and he wanted to see what the run would look like if he really pushed it harder. In October of 2014, PBT did a new game normal run for an SRG marathon that he got a 158 at. This was on the PC version of the game. This is the first run he would actually claim to be world record. He used Trickster the whole time, and overall, it was a much sloppier run than Psycho Child's. However, at the time, it would have been considered the world record, since the load screens being faster on PC and the addition of Turbo Mode helped him to push it under two hours. While he did know about Psycho Child's run, he never actually watched it, and just assumed that since it was so old, and that it was on PS2, that it wasn't going to be very good. So, PVT went on a crusade to find better strategies to beat the game faster. The obvious first choice was to speed up the Virgil fights with the implementation of Royal Guard. While Trickster leads to high mobility and a lot of invincibility frames for safety, it isn't being safe that speedrunners want. Ideally, they want to do as much damage as possible as fast as possible, and Royal Guard fits that perfectly. While it is labeled as a defensive style, the blocks of RG can do much more than just remove some damage. You see, RG has a timing-based parry, as well as the ability to store energy so that it can be released later. Blocking attacks with the correct timing builds Dante's rage meter, and doing a counter or release uses this energy to devastating results. This, combined with the counter also having a perfect timing for massive damage, makes Royal Guard a super satisfying and high damage, high risk, high reward way to play the game. This was ancient knowledge. In fact, Psycho Child all the way back in 2005 knew this was the way to go faster. He just didn't think it would be possible to do single segment. Psycho Child had been working on a segmented real guard run. No footage of this run exists today, but it is noted to have been a 159.13. For PS2, that is insane. 
even if it was done in segments. Unfortunately, there's no way of knowing what strategies were used for this run, but what we do know is that PVT was going to make some of its own. These releases happen to coincide with the release of the single most important website in speedrunning, speedrun.com. This was a universalized site dedicated to storing leaderboards and forums for any game that wanted to be hosted there, and to this day, it is the number one site for speedrun information and data storage. When this occurred, PVT would sign up to create the leaderboards for Devil May Cry 3, thus starting the recording of world records set from then on. However, just because there was a place for these runs does not mean that they would all be recorded there. In fact, the first run that shows up on speedrun.com is Peter Afro in December of 2015, supporting a nice and slow 150. Around that time, PVT had been joined by a keyboard runner who played on emulator called Gladier. The two battled it out for better times, going back and forth around the 130 mark in the summer of 2015. It's common, especially when a game is in its early development for speedruns, for speedrunners to not submit their times, even if they were the world record. What's the point if you're just going to improve it the next time you play? No one wants to create an extra ton of work for the moderators and have to verify all those runs. The two started battling it out, cutting minutes off of their runs each time fully abandoning Trickster in favor of doing something more akin to what that old segmented PS2 run must have looked like. While Trickster was slower, it became apparent why Psycho Child might have thought that Royal Guard wouldn't be used for single segment runs. It made the run harder. Like, a lot harder. The utility of a style such as this cannot be understated. Every single time an enemy attacks the player, there's an opportunity to do a gold release. If the player counters in a 3 frame window, or a 1 20th of a second, then massive damage is dealt. And if they miss, damage is taken. While the special edition release may have made normal mode easier, it was also never intended for most players to try to achieve this level of mastery over Royal Guard. But it also wasn't unintended either. Every single thing in the game that can hurt you can be blocked and countered. Building strategies around this could speed up the game tremendous amounts, but each additional release or block added drastically to the increase in difficulty. The more releases you miss, the closer you are to dying. And while Royal Guard is a lot faster, if you die, well, then you may as well have just played it safe. It wasn't so much about creating new strategies to implement this type of play as it was just mastering the game enough to make it even worth it. That's not to say that new strategies weren't made, however. In fact, the game was changing all the time. Orb routing was completely overhauled, runners stopped buying as many consumable items and stopped collecting so many orb caches. Holy Waters were routed in for killing Arkham, allowing for massive time saves on mission 19. More purple orbs were bought earlier, increasing the damage output early on, and weapons were entirely cut out of the route, skipping Spiral and no longer upgrading the shotgun. However, the influence of style play would not just stop a royal guard. It helped to shed light on the extent of things that can be blocked, parried, and cancelled. But what it really inspired is a lot of a technique called jump cancelling. When Dante is in the air, he can step off of an enemy's head. This gives him back all of his aerial maneuvers, with no cooldown allowing the player to do many actions without touching the ground. In style play, this is used to flex on all those plebs while I fly across the map air raving like a goddamn madman. The more utilitarian use of this technique for speedrunning is with strong aerial attacks, namely Agni and Rouge's aerial cross and Beowulf's dive kick. These two moves being cancelled into themselves greatly increases the damage output far beyond what is possible on the ground. While not as difficult as perfect guards and releases from a frame data perspective, jump cancels require consistency to be faster. Being able to do it once is no help, but being able to Goomba stop Virgil into the ground now that is fast. This would come to a bit of a halt near the 125 mark, where PVT and Gladiator would start to stagnate. Having already brought the time down almost 30 minutes, what was left was pure execution. There was no obvious optimization left, anything else would need to be worked for. Around this time, Gladiator made a full tutorial for the game, opening the door for many new people to come in and join the party. This kind of thing was extremely necessary for runs like Devil May Cry especially because the adaptation of Royal Garden to the run made the barrier for entry so much higher. With the skill ceiling raised, so too did the skill floor. 
as using easier approaches like Trickster became less and less valid the more they optimized the game. That is to say that the game would have seemingly come to a halt in progress if it wasn't for what would happen next. Raj, someone who would become famous in the DMC speedrunning community, submitted this run. The description for the run states, I'm submitting this so that you know someone else is running DMC3. And running it, he sure was. Over the next six months, Raj would take the game down to a 119.04, completely blowing Gladiator and PVT's times out of the water by about five minutes. This is around what I like to call the modern era of DMC3 speedrunning, as most strats have not changed too significantly since then. Raj simply played better. There was no tricks or gimmicks, maybe a few new strats here or there, but overall Raj is just good at what he does, and he displays it really well in his runs. The run at this point is forever changed, unrecognizable from the PS2 era. Efficiently killing waves upon waves of enemies as they spawn, cold, calculated, and efficient use of Royal Guard, routing Royal Guard charges across rooms and into boss fights for phase skips, and very efficient use of jump cancels. This is the age of the phase skip. In Mission 4, Raj builds guard from the explosions below and uses them to consistently get a 2 cycle on the Gigapede boss fight. Killing Agni and Rudra without them combining or running away becomes the standard. Virgil was also discovered to have a stun buildup that causes him to parry, and by doing moves that have minimal knockback but with high damage, the player can keep him stunned for long periods of time. Then, guarding all of his attacks and releasing them back at him for a super fast and efficient fight. Optimizing movement and Devil Trigger usage on missions like 8, allowing for full rage meter and Devil Trigger on the boss, bringing it down to a 2 cycle. It was also discovered that doing a perfect counter on a set of stairs causes Dante to zip across the map, allowing for insanely high movement speeds. For now, this would only be useful on mission 9, allowing the player to fly across this gap instead of running around for about 20 seconds of time save. Bringing Nevin down to a 2 cycle with the application of Royal Guard and proper DT routing. Better Holy Water routing in general, along with actually remembering to pick up the one at the end of mission 14 allowed for his usage to skip slow fights like the Spiders on Mission 10 and the Fallen on Mission 16. Jump cancelling and Royal Guard would create the hardest strategy in the run with Beowulf Quick Kill. Hitting the right spot in his eye does massive damage, and releasing after that having good jump cancels can lead to his instant death, even though no one would hit this in an actual run for a really long time. Stopping the Time Horse in its tracks and sending it back to Dark Souls 2 would prove to be so much faster than letting him run around. Proper release routing and damage dealing led to the discovery of skipping Virgil's phase 2 entirely, sending him right home to the Weave Sword where he drops below 40% HP. Skipping his second phase removes his Devil Trigger entirely and makes the fight way easier and much faster, but guarding his attacks is very tricky. Virgil has a few mix up and he really feels like a fighting game at times. This strat is still done just like this to this very day, and it's one of the hardest in the whole run. Proper use of Devil Trigger Explosion and Jump Cancelling with Beowulf totally transforms the late game, making fodder enemies explode under the foot of justice in no time flat. Release was used once again to skip the slow phase in the Lady fight, dropping her HP below a certain point before she ever gets the chance to run away, means that she'll stay on the ground and making the fight way faster. Jump Cancels absolutely destroy Doppelganger, leading to one of the easiest one cycles in the game. Holy Water was used on the King in the chest fight to be able to hit him right from the beginning, saving whole minutes over previous strategies. The final fight also went through similar transformations as Virgil 2. Dive Kick JC turns out to do a lot of damage, and Virgil only goes in to Devil Trigger at less than 45% HP. Setting up with Royal Guard and Devil Trigger Explosion, the runner now skips Virgil's Devil Trigger, leading to a fight that's only about 50 seconds long. The amount of progress that came out of this one year for the game was actually insane. For a game to come down in time about 30 minutes with no glitches being discovered, 10 years after its release is basically unheard of. Raj was one of the first to grind out a decent time, and it's super impressive watching these old runs just to see what the cutting edge was. These players had no clue how much faster it could get, but they kept pushing each other to get better, unsure of how far it could really go. 
PVT would then beat this time shortly after, getting a 118, and being the first to submit it. So Raj's 119 was technically never a world record. But this wouldn't end up mattering as much, as that 118 would turn out to be PVT's final run. And Raj was going to push it so much further. Just two months later, on the 19th of February 2016, Raj would get a 112.27, achieving what was thought to be the pinnacle for speed in DMC3. Having the longest standing record for DMC3 since Psycho Child, Raj would hold this 112.27 for a whole year. This run marked the end of both PVT and Raj's careers in DMC3 speedrunning, opting to pick up other games and losing sight on improving as much. PVT went on to run DMC4 Virgil at Games Done Quick in 2016, and Raj continued his rampage onto DMC2, optimizing the game and claiming the world record there as well. For a while, it seemed like DMC3, as far as speedrunning was concerned, was dead. There were a few people running it, but not often and not at a world record level. That is, until a new challenger would come for the throne. In October of 2016, Simateus would submit his first run of DMZ3, and no one could have seen the implications it would have for this game. Learning from Gladiator's tutorial and watching PVT streams, his run slowly built up the skill required to catch up to the legacy of those before him. And it took a while. He didn't have any natural propensity to play the game well, he just took his time and grinded it out, bit by bit, day by day. Until eventually, almost 6 months after learning the game, initially, he beat Raj's time. And only by 9 seconds. At this point in the game, 9 seconds is pretty negligible. It could have been anything in the run that made up that time. But for the time, it was super impressive, a classic underdog tale of someone rising in the ranks. But Simo wasn't really satisfied with this time. For him, it was less about the competition. Yeah, he had world record, but the game could be pushed so much further, and he knew it. So he just kept playing. Day by day, improving bit by bit. No massive grinds, no insane new strategies, and he just chipped away at the time. First achieving a 111, then a 110, then a 109, bringing it lower and lower. Across almost three years, bringing it down to a 10350. You see, Sim Mateus didn't want to be the best. He had the same mindset of SDA. It wasn't about who is the best, it's about how well it is done. The passion of someone honing their craft to make it better, indefinitely, is what fuels great creation. By grinding away over time, Sim Mateus cemented himself as the god of DMC3, raising the skill ceiling of the game to heights never thought possible. And it was intimidating. Being nearly 10 minutes faster than second place in a speedrun is no easy feat. Motivating oneself to keep grinding, regardless of what place you're in, regardless of the lack of competition, is just damn impressive. And that's how it was for a really long time. Over those three years, no one even came close. Hell, no one besides Timoteus even beat Raj's time until October of 2019. He wasn't totally alone though, people picked up the game. Hell, C. Mateus even created a brand new tutorial from scratch detailing all the strategies and the best way to learn them. But no one was up to the task of getting really good enough to break that top two. It just proved too intimidating for anyone to really try. That is, until the rise of the Three Amigos occurred. In 2017, the HD collection of the game released on PC, creating a whole new way for players to get into the game in a more serious way. Console players always had the drawback of having exceedingly long loading times, and the original PC port that Ubisoft made back in 2006 is basically unplayable without dozens of hours of modding to make it work correctly. While the HD version of the MC3 wasn't as fast as the original, or have as much of the tech that it did, it was an excellent starting place for new players to get their footing. Then later, when they wanted their more competitive times, they could do the work necessary to get the OG port working. That same year, Maxi Lobes did the first modern run of DMC1 at GDQ, and it was clean. The man single-handedly cleaned up the entire leaderboard and routed a super good run from basically nothing. Then, he brought it to the world stage with style. This would inspire even more people like myself to want to speedrun games that aren't normally considered speedrun friendly. Three people that would have become great friends and greatly influenced DMC3 speedrunning would start running around the same time in early 2019. The Parkles, a super high-level Half-Life runner, Loner Hero, the man who dethroned Rad from DMC2 around that time, 
and Waifu, some nerd who learned DMC1 inspired by Maxi's GDQ run because he was too afraid of learning this game because it looked too hard. All three of them got times in around the 120 area by learning from C. Mateus's tutorial and helped each other get better by competing with each other. Catching up to the top wasn't any one of their goals. They each just wanted to get better at the game over time. Besides, I know personally that C. Mateus' time seemed like an insurmountable goal. I unironically thought that no one would ever beat this time. After all, he was the god of DMC3. Slowly but surely, we all got better, making progress and then taking long breaks. The Pargle stopped around the 116 mark where he was a little burnt out in the game, and ever since, he has been focused on real life instead. However, me and Loner Hero kept pushing to be the first two people to ever beat Raj, besides Simateus. Both Loner Hero and myself stopped around the 107 mark, Loner beating me by about one minute. Loner stopped because he was getting way too burnt out and wanted to go on with other projects like Ninja Gaiden Black and DMC4, where I only wanted to get a good enough time that I could get the run into games done quick. While I never intended to be a marathon runner type guy, I was greatly inspired by such things. After all, Maxi is the dude who got me into speedrunning Devil May Cry, and I only knew him because of GDQ. The same could be said with GTB and Resident Evil 4. These people I looked up to were full-time streamers, and being in college myself for something I didn't really want to do, I loved the idea of doing that myself. I made a plan and gained a lot of hype from the release of Resident Evil 2 Remake, eventually making Twitch partner and gaining a decent following. But I learned from others' mistakes. I saw people like JTB and Pharaoh, those who got attached to their games and were never allowed to leave, and I decided right then and there that that would not be me. I started branching out to new games, and I tried to emulate the success of people I looked up to, like Maxi. The one factor I saw that all those who did successful variety speedrunning was that they did GDQ runs and as many of them as they possibly could. So my goal with DMC3 at first was to enjoy running my favorite game at my own pace. And for the first year or so, that's what I did. Casually getting into the 116 range and then stopping. This all changed, however, when submissions for AGDQ 2019 were announced. This lit a fire under me and motivated me to push even further beyond. With the help of Parkles, Simo, and Loner, I broke into top two, getting a 108 and submitted to HDQ 2019. I ended up getting into GDQX in 2019, a smaller event that would be hosted at TwitchCon that year. This run would be the first of its kind, the first time DMC3 would ever be shown off on a big stage since Flicky did his monstrosity back in 2013. And I would have a star-studded couch to back me up. Without going into too much detail, let's just say that I was drastically unprepared for this event. I was supposed to bring a game on the hard drive and install it that way, but I didn't, so I had to download it on site. While that doesn't sound terrible, note that this was at TwitchCon and over Wi-Fi. I almost didn't have enough time to download the game before my run, and I was supposed to go on stage and play it. I was actually warned that if I didn't get it done on time that they would have to skip my run, and Mike Uyama scolded me for it. It was all deserved, but thankfully a tech guy in the back was updating his MacBook on the Wi-Fi and he graciously stopped the update, tripling my download speed. The download finished about 30 minutes before my run. This means I literally couldn't practice at all, and it was my first time ever running at a marathon. I didn't do any smaller ones before, and I just jumped right on stage in front of like 80,000 people. Thank god I had some of the best entertainers in the world to back me up with Maxi Lobes and Eternal Enigma. Overall, the run went really well. I showed off the run as it was, real guard and all showing the world that yes, DMC3 can be speedrun, and yes, it's super fucking cool. Once I did the run, I was just about done with DMC3 for a speedrun. I would run it from time to time, but I never thought about getting down to loner's level or even near SEMO. I thought that the run was unbeatable. We all did. And it effectively was, as no one dared to try. In the next two years, the DMC speedrunning community would explode. No doubt in part due to mine, Maxi, and the Cosmic's GDQ runs, as well as many ESA showcases. DMC5's release brought people's attention back to the franchise, reviving it after a 10-year stagnation, and it couldn't have had a better speedrun representative. Cosmic or just Cosmic, and I run DMC. And if there's any way to describe this run, I would say it's tricky. So... DMC1, 4, and 5 were all getting much more attention. The leaderboards got more competitive, and times went down fast. 
but not really for DMC3. It had a surge of new runners in popularity, sure, but no one really wanted to crack that top spot. A new generation of runners joined the fray, people like Heiss, Dizzy Splits, Rage Cage, Igna, Cosmic, Dan Spence, and more, but they all had some growing pains to get through. There was four years of lineage and execution to work through before they could get into the top times. But it wasn't going to be a suicide mission for much longer, because one man would inspire the whole community in ways he could have never imagined. In February of 2021, Loner Hero wanted to pay Simateus back for all he has done for us, by finally giving him a true rival. I thought he was crazy. I saw this dude grinding away every day for months, saving smaller and smaller amounts of time. First, he gets a 106, then a 105.59, then a 105.49, then a 105.20, then a 105.15, then a 105.02, then a 104.31, and then a 104.23. Loner would show up every day and just grind it out. He would just play and play, and if it ever got too hard for him, he'd just laugh it off and practice more. No one even ever tried to approach Simo because it was just too intimidating. But Loner was there to show us that Simo was just a man and that he could be taken down. That it would be hard, but it was possible. The grind that he went through to get this time was so impressive to me. I couldn't fathom playing that precisely, that efficiently. This would culminate into a single moment on February 22nd, 2021, when Lunar would achieve this run.
This... The second person who ever gets a floor but... This run was phenomenal. He achieved a 103.54 in real time. But you might notice that there's another timer on there, and that is why Loner is so upset. You see, the official timing method for Devil May Cry 3 switched over to a load remover timer, or LRT. That's the 102.13 that he got in the bottom. Going off the official timing method, this run was actually world record by nearly a minute and 40 seconds. This is because you remove the load screens on PC speedruns since those are affected directly by the hardware of each player. Eliminating these times makes it equal for everyone competing. However, when Simateus did his run, no such tool existed, so he doesn't have a load remover time. If Loner was to submit this run right when he got it, he would technically have the world record, even though he missed it by 5 seconds in real time and arguably, C. Mateus's run was still better. This was not going to be enough for Loner. Loner set out to beat Simo, and he did, but he wanted to beat him on his own terms, in real time. So the grind continued. It continued, and the initial grind was going to be nothing compared to what was to come. One month, and over 1,000 attempts later, Loner would be on a great run. Out of mission 3, he had a perfect Cerberus fight and was still 11 seconds behind St. Mateus, who had an insanely good early game. A good 2 cycle Gigapede and a faster combat on mission 4 brings it back down to 4 seconds behind St. Mateus. Loner makes up the difference by having insane jump cancels on mission 7 and playing risky on Virgil, shooting 20 seconds ahead of St. Mateus. This lead extends another 2 seconds on mission 8 with better movement. On mission 9, Sima gets the zip and it takes him a while, whereas Loner doesn't even go for it at all. This breaks even and Loner keeps his 22 second lead out of mission 9. Loner misses the quick kill on Beowulf and loses his entire lead, making him all tied up with Simo at the start of mission 12. Then something happened that would change Loner's mental space for the rest of the run. This is the fastest Garion fight ever recorded at the time. He managed to release at an angle so perfect that it hit both the horse and the carriage, doing massive damage. At this moment, Loner stops talking, but we all know that this is the moment. This is the run that dethrones Simateus. Chad falls silent with him in solidarity, as he possibly has the cleanest Virgil 2 fight I have ever seen. Loner plays damn near perfectly for the next few missions, getting another 10 seconds ahead of Simo by the end of mission 16. Loner's now 30 seconds ahead of Simateus heading into the late game. It starts to get to him. You can hear him breathing and trying to calm himself down as the chat silence breaks, the hype overflowing from all of us watching. With the pressure on, Loner chokes some platforming and loses 10 seconds, but has a perfect 17 besides him. Mission 18 is the largest choke point in the run. Everything here is extremely difficult, and failure is not an option in this scenario. Perfect chess. Perfect Cerberus. Perfect Agni and Rudra. And a perfect Beowulf fight. Loner shatters his best time ever through mission 18 and is now 30 seconds ahead of Simateus. But it's not over yet. Both combat encounters on 19 can be easily choked for massive amounts of time, and messing up Arkham would kill the entire run. Not to mention, he still has Virgil 3, one of the hardest bosses in the game left. Loner comes up 400 orbs short of the last holy water for Arkham and his nerves run high. Running to the boss 
chat screams at him to buy that last holy one. He opts to play it safe into a slightly slower but much safer version of the Arkham fight, and it loses him about 4 seconds. And on March 14th, 2021, Loner would shatter everyone's expectations, completing his over 4,000s attempts and achieving a 103-34 real time. Just under 102 LRT. This made Loner the first person to beat C. Mateus in Devil May Cry 3 in over four years and three months. The god of Devil May Cry 3 was dead. First of all, Simo, eat my fucking dust. <laughs> but I wanna. I, the reason why I said this, eat my dust because I wanna give special shout out to Simo because I honestly don't think I'd reach this far without him. Like he's one, like he's my biggest ins inspiration for running this game in the first place and making me feel that. I can push this game as hard as I can. So, Rit, thanks a lot for letting me. Like, when I first started running DMC3, I was like, you know, RG was really hard. Maybe we should have different, like, style category or something. Like, especially when I was near speed running. And then someone told you, like, you just gotta play the game more or something. Like, you really need to understand, like, What's the speedrunning is all about? <laughs> Shout out to his 10k attempts. Like, you can clearly see that there is a 6k attempt difference because he worked for that game for so long. He's part of the reason why I've managed to come up my own idea to optimize this game further. Cosmic Waifu. I really appreciate her believing in me. And uh, thanks for also Cosmic gifting me HD collection. And especially you, Coconut Razium. You're, you're something else. I don't know how to wrap this up, but you guys are amazing. <laughs> Shedding tears over the trials, tribulations, mental and physical anguish, and hard work. The entire community put behind this run, Loner did what I thought literally not possible. This was truly the most beautiful moment I had ever witnessed in gaming, and seeing my friend push so hard for so long brought me to tears. Before this point I had never cried when I got a world record, or even watching anyone else get one, but this was different. It wasn't only the rain, this was more than just a run to all of us, to me, to Loner, to C. Mateus. It was what it means to speedrun. It's overcoming insurmountable odds with your friends and pushing yourself beyond what you thought possible. This moment was way more important than any GDQ run. This moment inspired the rest of us to push harder. And it worked. This is what the leaderboard looked like when Loner beat Simo. And this is what it looks like now. Not only is Simo back and improving his times, but the entire community has lowered their time by an average of over 5 minutes in the last 6 months since Loner got record. Not just because it was proven to be doable, but because Loner helped to inspire us to do it. Loner is a huge part of my life and a lot of others as well, but what you may not know is that he lives in the Middle East and is not easily able to get a job due to many unfortunate circumstances. He's actually been gaming on an old laptop he bought many years ago, and can't play many games on stream at a high quality due to this. That's why when Ironside PC reached out to me saying that they wanted to work with me, I immediately knew that I wanted in. Ironside PC makes amazing pre-built computers with all of today's top specs and custom aesthetics. 
they worked with me to create this monster of a machine. It's a Wii Work machine that I always wanted, sporting a Ryzen 5900X and a GTX 3060 with 32GB of DDR4 RAM. It's perfect for streaming my high octane speedruns at 1440p while rendering videos at the same time. While I didn't really need a PC upgrade, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to give back. So I sent my old PC all the way to Loner on my own dime just because I really wanted to say thanks for everything he does for us. I try to always do something like this when I take an advertising deal, and Ironside was generous enough to help me find out ways to ship him the components, and even giving me extra packaging for shipping. So, yep, I'm gonna go ship this out to Loner. That is a big thanks, man. I love you, dude. If you're interested in getting an awesome PC for yourself, go over to ironsidecomputers.com and use promo code WAIFU to get 5% off your order. In the grind to catch up to Loner, a runner by the name Heiss was messing around with some mod tools for the game and found a little something in Mission 4. It turns out if you zip off this railing, you can skip right past the pit fight in Mission 4 and the Gigapede boss fight. That discovery led to much excitement from myself and Simoteus, who then immediately got started to try and find a way to make it viable in actual runs. With a few hours of work, I managed to do it, and then I made a consistent setup for it. This skip turned out to save about a minute and 50 seconds of recurrent strats and was the first major skip in the entire game. This revolutionized the game. Skipping that much in Mission 4 and two very RNG heavy rooms made the run much more interesting in the early game. And skipping that many kills caused Dante not to get enough experience to get level 3 Royal Guard in the entire run. And it turns out, level 3 Royal Guard doesn't even save any time. So, that's cool. The really important thing about this discovery, though, is it closes the skill gap between most of the runners in Simateus. With this new time save from the skip and the load remover, most runners felt comfortable with experimenting more. Experimenting was the name of the game from here on out. As well as Simo routed the game since 2019, he did most of it by himself. The extra manpower along with the new perspective has been absolutely blowing this game wide open when it comes to new strategies. When I saw Loner take down Simo, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to take down the new god, Loner. So I started my very own grind. I had about 3 minutes to go to catch up on RTA, but that was going to be easy since I could save 2 minutes from just the new skip and other strategies alone. Following Loner's lead though, I knew that that wouldn't be enough. It just so happened that if you take the time save from the new Mission 4 skip and added it on top of Loner's run, that would put the game at just under one hour. So that was my goal, to beat Loner's run and be the first person to complete Devil May Cry 3 in under one hour. The grind was shorter than I had anticipated. I ran the game at least once a week every week, so I never was fully rusty, and I quickly got a new PB with the skip, bringing my time down to a 104. Then I went on a rampage that I could never have foreseen. Fuck you! Fuck me, bird. Go back to baby.
yes, dude. Fuck yes. Oh my god. <sighs> oh my god, dude. <sighs> 5931? What the fuck, dude? Story time. So I started running this game back in like 2018. It's my favorite video game. I love this game. It's my favorite game. And I never ever thought that I would be able to have record in this game because C. Mateus' time was like 10 minutes faster than second place and I was not even at second place and I grinded it I just took it casually I didn't want to fucking I didn't want to like go super hard because I didn't want to ruin the game for me casually and I just like you know take it slow and I, I slowly got there got like sub 110 then I stopped playing and then I fucking Lately, I saw I saw Loner Hero, the fucking best dude, come out, and he's like, "I'm gonna challenge fucking C. Mateus," and he took the gap from like ten minutes to five minutes to three minutes to two minutes, and then he fucking beat him. And it was on when he, I was there when he beat him in his chat, and it was honestly the only time I've ever cried when I when I saw someone PB or PB'd myself. And it was fucking awesome because I thought I never thought anyone would beat that time. I never I never thought anyone would. And then Loner finally did, and that inspired me because Loner's fucking awesome. <laughs> so I got your back, Loner. Good shit, dude. And when I beat Loner's time because of the new skip. That wasn't going to be enough for me because I wanted I wanted to beat him on his own terms. I wanted to beat his time without the new skip. And I did. And I was the first person to ever beat DMC3 in under an hour. And I'm stoked, dude. There you have it. That brings us to today. Where record can and probably will be taken by anyone on this leaderboard. With new strats coming out every day and the community more active than ever, runners like Dizzy, Heiss, and Rage progressing faster than ever, and new up-and-comers like Frenchie getting 103s without even using GigaZip? This game is amazing. The impact it's had on each of us cannot be measured. For some, that's manifested in stylish expression. For others, it's speedrunning. But for me, it's the sense of community. The binding of people together in the common interest of everything stylish, and there is simply nothing better. Here's to what the future holds. I'm just hoping I'm there to see it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you want to support me financially, the best way to do so is through Patreon. Just like all these vehicle patrons did right here. They're the best. I love you. Huge shout out to Summoning Assault for pioneering this epic style of video. I think that it's changed a lot of speedrunning culture for the good. And... Um, I hope that he sees this video one day, maybe even.